those who are in the house, and good morning to all those who are watching online around the country and around the world. Thank you so much for making Crossroads your church home and your family. Uh, you know, I love the testimony about, uh, about faith in the, in the baby. And think about this. I mean, every person that gave helped save those two lives. And also, as you gave, that while Benson was in Uganda, he was baptizing over 200 people. It said it took him four and a half hours to baptize everybody. You have an investment in that as well because we support them. Uh, it's amazing what happens is, as, as we all get together, the lives we can affect, uh, virtually the eternal lives and, and physical lives of, that we can do as we, as we give to God. You know, I love testimonies. We all love to hear testimonies. We all love to, to be able to share a testimony of what God is doing in our lives and through our life. Here's the thing that we don't like, however. We don't like those four pesky little uh, words, or not words, but letters at the start of that, do we? We don't like the word test. I don't know about you. I do not like test. I love the, the money part. I just don't like the test that goes with the money part, right? And, but the thing is that you're never going to have a test or testimony without a test. That's part of what it has. You're never going to read a book and get a testimony. You're never going to just listen to a sermon and get a testimony. You're never going to go to seminary and get a testimony. A testimony is found as we, we go through tests in this world. We said last week that God never tempts us. He's never going to tempt you. God will never do that. It's always Satan who tempts you. But the other thing that we, we know is God will test us, doesn't he? And God always tests us for our benefit. There's really two things, two reasons he gives us tests. One is so we can prove our, ourselves to God, and the other is so God can prove himself to us. It's when we go through a test and we don't have enough resources that we realize that God is our provider. It's when we struggle with health that we feel, uh, realize that God is the one who gives us health. It's when we don't have enough, it's when we're hurting and things that we realize that God is the one who comforts us, who strengthens us, who helps us. It's when we go through those tests that we get, realize how amazing God is. And here's the thing, too, that we always go through, we go through, through quizzes, you know, and tests throughout, throughout the week. Every time we have the, the opportunity to do the right thing or the wrong thing, it's a test, isn't it? Every time we have the opportunity to help somebody, it's a test. A few minutes ago, you had an opportunity to give, that's a test. Every time that, that, that you have somebody cuts you off in traffic or your parents tell you to do something you don't want, don't want to do, it's a test. Every time you go through a disappointment or a discouragement in life, every single one of those, it's, it, there's a test on how we handle those things. And here's the thing, you know, we have those little quizzes throughout, the, throughout our life, but then there's times in life that we go through hell, isn't there? There's times in life that we go through seasons that are like midterms or finals for those that have been through, through, through college that are just brutal, 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 brutal. But here's the reason. God, when God brings those into our life, it is always for the purpose of taking us to a whole nother level. It's always because something, God has something great in store and he's got to prepare us for what he's got in store for, for us at that, at that time. And, and when you go through those tough times, those big brutal tests, don't ever forget the quizzes and the tests that have led you up to that. When you go through the, the tough times over here, don't ever forget how God has brought you through yesterday. When you go through struggles today, always remember the God of yesterday that has helped you, all the times God has provided for you, all the times God has, has come through for you, all the times God has changed situations, all the times that God has brought breakthrough. Remember those times in those little things of yesterday for the big things that we face right now. You know, last week we started a two-part series that we finished today on, on Abraham. We're in a series called All In, and we looked at people in the Bible who are, are, are taking a step all in, going all out with, uh, with God. And just a, a quick background of what we talked about last week is we saw that, that God told Abraham, I want you to leave everything and everybody that you know. And I want you to go to a place that I will show you. I'm not going to give you any of the details until you're there. And, and lo and behold, Abraham goes, okay. He takes this incredible step of faith, goes all in with, uh, with God. And God gives him this incredible promise. He says, he says this. He says, God, I'm going I'm to bless you. I'm going to make your name great. I'm going to make you a great nation. 
I'm going to bless you and bless others through you. Anybody who blesses you, I will bless. Anybody who curses you, I will curse, and I will give them a hard time. And, but here's the problem with him becoming a nation, is they couldn't even have a baby. He and Sarah, first she is barren, which means she can't have a, a, a baby. Then she's ancient, he's ancient. I mean, if you're going to look for somebody to have a child through and start a nation through, a, you know, a barren octogenarian is not the one that you, you try to go through. That's not your first pick, especially when she's got a geezer husband either. But the fact is, when God says, you're going to have a child, uh, Abraham believes him even though he's telling him something that's absolutely impossible. But then through the years, all of a sudden, there's, they, now they have to wait over a decade, and, and their faith begins to wane. And they try to take matters into their, their own hands, and that, that turns out to be a fiasco. But then God looks at him and gets really specific, and he says, one year from now, Sarah's going to have a baby in her arms. And they both laugh, because in the, in the natural, this isn't going to happen. He's gone from, from saying, God, I believe in everything you're doing, and then now he's laughing and going, God, can you really pull this off? And I love that even the heroes of our faith struggle sometimes with what's going on in, in their life. But, uh, but then, lo and behold, one year later, she's holding a, a baby in her arms, and the laughter that they had of pain or the laughter of cynicism turned into laughter of joy. God always has the last laugh. And that's where we start the story today. If you have your, your Bible or your phone or anything else, you may want to turn to Genesis chapter 22. And here's what I want you to do. I want you to put yourself in Abraham's sandals because a lot of us know the end of this story. We know what's going to happen at the end of this. He didn't know what was going to happen. And imagine yourself getting this message from God that's going to about separate your head from your shoulders. Sometime later, God tested Abraham. He said to him, Abraham... And Abraham said, replied, here I am. It's one word in the, in the Hebrew, and it's the word hanani. And it basically means, God, I, I'm all ears. God, I'm here. I'm available. Anything you want to say through me, anything you want to do in my life, I am here. Can you imagine if we started every day with that kind of attitude? Hanani, God, I'm here. I'm listening to what you want to say. God, I'm all available. I'm completely, I'm completely yours this day. Abraham said, here I am. And then God said, take your son, your only son Isaac, whom you love, kind of rubbing it in a little bit there, and go to the region of Moriah. Sacrifice him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains I will tell you about. I mean, can you imagine, especially you as parents, can you imagine God saying this to you? And you're heartbroken. You're confused because this is the one who the promise is going to come through. It's, it seems like it's totally against the nature of, uh, of God that God is telling you, uh, you this. And now here's the thing. We're told right up front that, there's, that this is a test. That, in other words, Isaac is never in danger here. He's never going to be hurt ever whatsoever. God has that. So we know that. We are privy to that information. Abraham is not privy to that in, in information. He does not know that. So imagine going through that. And here's the thing that, that basically God was saying to Abraham at the start, the first time he said this, I want you to trust me with your past. All those things you went, I want you to, we're gonna do a brand new beginning. I want you to trust me with your past. But now he's saying to Abraham, I want you to trust me with your future. Because Isaac was his future. That was his heritage. That's the one, his lineage that was going to carry on and, and his inheritance and all this. So he's saying, will you trust me with your, with your future? But here's the thing that I thought of. Can I just be honest with you? Can we be real with each other? I, I trust God a lot with my past. I do. I mean, I really believe that God has forgiven all my sins because of what Jesus Christ did on the, on the cross. I believe there's not one of them that is not, that is not covered by the blood of, uh, of Jesus. I also believe that God can use my past and my experiences in the past, the stupid things I've done, the good things I've done in the past, and use those experiences to, to, bring, to bring glory to him in the, in the present and in my, in my future. I believe God can take my brokenness in the past and he can heal that because I've seen him do that time and again. I, I trust God a lot with my past. I also trust God a lot with my with my extended future, with way out here. I trust God with my eternity. 
I absolutely believe with all my heart that I'm going to spend forever in heaven with God. Again, not because of anything I've done. Trust me on that. But because of everything that, that Jesus did on the cross. And, but here's where I struggle with, with trusting God as much as I should. And maybe you can relate to this. I trust God, I mean, struggle with that more of trusting God with today and tomorrow and the next day and the, the next day. And this doesn't make a lick of sense. You know why it doesn't make any sense? It's because if I trust God with the biggest thing in my life, which is my eternity, where I'm going to spend forever, that's the 100 out of 100. If I trust him with that, why can't I trust him with the 20 or the 30 or the 5 or the 7 that happens every day? Makes no sense whatso whatsoever. Another thing that it, uh, that it, it does is... is I don't understand. I mean, that's like trusting somebody that they can bench press uh, uh, 500 pounds, but they can't lift five pounds, right? And the other reason is, is that God has, has batted a thousand in my life. There's never a time that God has not hit it out of the park. God has, has provided for me every time. God has come through for me every time. That does not mean that I have not been brokenhearted at times, because I have. That does not mean that I have not gone through difficulty after difficulty after difficulty in my life just like you, because I have. And that doesn't mean that I have not been confused at times with what God is doing, because I have been with those as well. But God has been incredibly, incredibly faithful in my life. And you know, Jesus would use nature, nature a lot of times for, for an example, and, and maybe this will help us understand this. I, I trust the sun 100% that it's going to come out every day. I've lived, I figured it out about 20,000 days in my life. And, and the sun has never let me down. It has come up every single day of my, of my life. Now that does not mean I've seen it come up every day. That does not mean I have not seen rainy days. That does not mean I have not seen rainy weeks where a week at a time I never saw the sun. But somehow, some way, I, I trust in the sun to come up so much that even when I don't see the sun or even when I don't feel the sun, I trust that the sun is there. I trust that the sun is going to break through the clouds. I trust that the sun, that there's going to be sunshine again. And isn't that weird that we can trust the sun completely but sometimes we forget to trust 100% the one who created the, the son, the son of God who made that. And I don't know about you, but I need to trust God more in the present and in God more for this week and the next week and that than I do even for my past and in my, in my future. Another thing is, is that, uh, so it goes on to this, verse three. Early the next morning, Abraham got up and saddled his donkey. It's the word early that blows me away here. Because I don't know about you, but if, I, if God's telling me this, I, I'd try to hem and haw and get, get out this, you know, take the longest time to get to that mountain. But he did it immediately. I mean, he said immediately he got up as soon as he could to obey God. Now, this is completely different from the people that, that Jesus encountered in Luke chapter 9 because Jesus is saying to several different people at different times, follow me, follow me, follow me, and they come up with one excuse after the other. They're going, yeah, I will after I, I, I will after I. Hey, well, let me first do this after I. And isn't that weird that a lot of times we come up with that too, don't we? We say, God, I'm, you know, I'll give my life to you after I. God, I'll be serious about you after I. God, I'll read my, I'll do this. I'll get involved. I'll get involved in a ministry after I. And we can go from after I to after I to after I and never accomplish any of the things that we intend to, to do with, uh, with God. But let me, we need to ask ourselves the question, which one truly are we more of? Are we the immediately person? Or are we, God, I'll do it after I, after I and go on and on and on with waiting for that. I love how he just does it immediately. And then he says this. He took, up, he took with him two of his servants and his son Isaac. When he had cut enough wood for the burnt offering, he set out for the place God had told him about. On the third day, Abraham looked up and saw the place in the distance. The third day. Can you imagine being Abraham and for three days, you have to have your son next to you knowing what you're about to do? Whoa. I mean, in... And I think about this because I've been a pastor a while and here's what I, I appreciate about people. I so thank God for so many of you who give me testimonies all the time. You've gone through hell or you're going through hell. And you know what you do? You get up and live another day. And you get up and you trust God 
again and you believe in God another time I'm telling you some of the gutsiest things I've ever seen in my life is somebody who just puts one foot forward again and trusts God for one more thing and trusts God and lives one more day sometimes when you're in the midst of the struggle and you're in the midst of the valley of the shadow of death one more day of just trusting him and going forward is is something to be applauded for and listen to this. He said to his servants, stay here with the donkey while I and the boy go over there. Don't miss this. We will worship and we will come back to you. And here's the phrase that blows me away. We will worship. Now, that's so weird to me. We're going to worship. And I don't know how, and, and he went for two reasons up to that mountain. He went to sacrifice his child and the other reason he went to worship. How do you worship knowing what you're about to do? How do you possibly worship believing or seeming like God's pulling a number, putting a number on you? How does it seem like, how do you worship when your heart is breaking? How do you worship God when you don't understand what he's doing? How do you worship God in that? Maybe the same way many of you worship God this morning. If some of you are struggling, and you know what you did? You came to church. You watched online. You're watching online right now, even though you're not understanding everything that's happening in your life. And you're trusting, in, and you sang songs of praise and glory to God today. Way to go. Because what you're doing is you're saying, I, I don't even care the circumstances. may be something that I don't understand, but I'm going to worship God anyway. And there's times when we worship God out of the gratitude of our heart because God's doing so many amazing things in our life. And there's sometimes that we just give a, a, a sacrifice of praise and we worship God anyway, even when we don't understand. And I've thought that part about we. I mean, he basically says this to the, to the, the guys. He goes, he goes, guys, my son and I, we're gonna go up on this mountaintop. We're gonna have church up there. And then we're gonna both come back to you. And we're going, wait, wait, wait. Abe, how do you do that? How are you saying that? Your son's supposed to be dead by the time he gets up there. How are you saying we're both? Talk about a statement of faith. How is he making the statement that we're both going to come back if he's going to sacrifice his son there? Hebrews tells us what was happening and going through uh, his mind at this time. Hebrews chapter 11, the faith chapter, says this, By faith Abraham, when God tested him, offered Isaac as a sacrifice, he who had received the promise was about to sacrifice his one and only son. Even though God had said to him, it's through Isaac that your offspring is going to be reckoned. Abraham, don't miss this, reason that God could raise the dead and figured with speaking, he did receive Isaac back from the dead. You know, for any of us to believe in a resurrection, that's a whole lot of faith, isn't it? But we've, there's, there's, there's resurrections that have taken place, aren't there? I mean, we have Peter resurrected somebody that Paul did, that Elijah, Elisha did. Jesus uh, resurrected several people from the, uh, from the dead and resurrected himself from the dead. But how about this? He, Abraham believed that God was going to resurrect his son even though that had never happened one time in human history before. I mean, he believed that God was not only going to do something impossible, but something that had never, ever, ever, ever been done before. Do we have enough faith in God that God, not only are you going to do the impossible, but I believe you're going to do something that's never been done before. I hope that God does something that he's never done before in your life this week, this month, in this, in this season of life. I pray that God does some things in your life right now that he's never done before, a new beginning, a fresh start, something more alive than he's ever done before. I really believe I'm speaking that to somebody right now, that God, it's a new beginning in something. And God says, forget the past. Do not dwell on the past. See, I'm beginning a new thing. Are you even going to be aware of it? Are we going to see that in our, in our life? And then here, you know, I, I love this too. said this, Abraham took the wood from the burnt offering and placed it on his son, Isaac. And he himself carried the fire and the knife. As the two of them went on together, Isaac spoke up and said to his father, Abraham, Father, yes, my son. Abraham replied, the fire in the wood's here, Isaac said. Where's the lamb for the burnt offering? Abraham answered, God himself will provide the lamb for the burnt offering, my son. And the two of them went on together. I mean, he's, he's saying, Dad, what's up? I don't get it. And Isaac, I, I mean, and Abraham, I love this. He's going, son, I'm honest with you. I don't get it either. I, just, I don't have an answer for you here. But here's what I know. God's faithful. And God's going to pull something out. And God's going to do something. What faith. 
And then he says this, when they reached the place God had told him about, Abraham built an altar there and arranged the wood on it. He bound his son Isaac and laid him on the altar on top of the wood. And here's something that we may not understand. A lot of times we may picture that Isaac's this little, little kid. He's not. Remember, they just put the wood on him. He just put the, the wood that he's carrying all the wood for this. And other, most Bible scholars believe he was a, a young man of about 15 years old, which means Abraham was 115. And how many of you know that a 15-year-old can take on a 115-year-old seven days a week, right? And this blows me away about Isaac. He's basically, he has so much trust in his dad's love for God and his dad's hearing God's voice that he's willing to say, God, Dad, I don't understand this either, but I'm trusting you to hear from, from God for me. And then he says this, when he reached out his hand and took the knife to slay his son, can you imagine that? But the angel of the Lord called out to him from heaven, Abraham, Abraham, guess what he replied? Hanani, here I am. I'll always be here. Whatever you have to say, God, I'm all, I'm all yours. Do not lay a hand on the boy. Do not do anything to him. Now I know that you fear God because you have not withheld from me your son, your only son. I love the, the painting that Rembrandt did of this picture. This is Rembrandt's The Sacrifice of Isaac. And look, look at what I love about this is the angel catches him right in the middle in the act. He didn't just yell to him. He's catching, the, he's catching his arm in the middle of his, uh, the, the knife falls to the, the ground. And this is what I picture. But I picture, I love it that God's never late. I mean, he, this is the perfect timing. The timing has to be split second. And God's timing is always perfect. I don't know about in your life, God's never been late. Man, he's been barely sneaking under the wire a dozen times, a hundred times. But God's never late. He never will be. Here's something too. Abraham looked up, and there in a thicket he saw a ram caught by its horns. Seriously? It just so happens that there happens to be a, a ram caught there at that exact moment. How many know that God has this set up long before Abraham raised his hand? God already had the answer there for him. You know, God does this throughout Scripture. You see this with, I don't know if you know this, but, but when the, the children of Israel walked into the Jordan River as it parted, you know what happened? It was 100 miles upstream that it stopped, that the water had stopped, 100 miles upstream. So that means that God had the answer for, for minutes, for a long time, for maybe hours going on its way before they even took that first obedient step. That's how ahead of the game God is. How about this for First Peter? It says, says this, he, talking about Jesus, was chosen before the creation of the world, but was revealed during these last times for your sake. Do you know what that means? That means before God even created the world, he knew what you and I were going to do. He knew how we were going to blow it. And he had the answer. He had Jesus on the way to the cross before we had even, even done the first, the first thing, before the creation was even there. God had an answer before we even had the problem. God had the answer before we even, even, even blew it. And I love this, that God does this all the time. I just thought of one story, that there's a, a lady that's a, a hero of mine. Her name is, uh, is Heidi Baker. Heidi Baker has orphanages in Africa. She literally gets kids not only off the street, she gets them out of the dump. I've been to this place. You can't get any worse on this planet than Maputo, Mozambique, where she is doing this. And I've been to her, her orphanage. I've been to her house. I've, I, I've heard her tell one story that blew me away that I love about just God's provision, God's answer to prayer. And here was the situation that she's, she's responsible for at this time hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of orphans. And they go to the little shed that they have with the food and there's nothing there. I mean zero, not a bite and there's also no food or no money that they have that there's nothing in the in the kitty whatsoever either zero what do you do when you have hundreds of orphans to feed and you have no food or you have no money so she and the lady just prayed and they just go god these are your kids do something take care of them we need a miracle and she said as soon as they said amen all of a sudden she got a phone call and they said said is this heidi baker she said yes it is and they said, we have a freighter. Imagine this, a freighter. Imagine how big a freighter is full of food that we've been asked to give to you. I said, do you have a place to put it? She said she lied on the spot and said, sure, I have a place. They had a little outbuilding right there. 
And no sooner had she said that and hung up with this person than, than a person comes driving up in a Mercedes Benz. And, and this is, again, if you've ever seen the movie Blood Diamond, that is where this happened. And this person is scared to death driving in this area with a Merc. And so what he does is he, he th grabs, throws some keys to her and says, this is for you, and, and drives back as fast as he can away from, away from that. Well, it turns out that this is uh, the keys to a warehouse. So in one moment, she's gone from not having any food whatsoever to having a freighter full of food and a warehouse to put it in. God had the answer before she even knew, before, even before she started to, to pray. And going on, it says this. He went on, over and took the ram and sacrificed as a burnt offering instead of his son. So Abraham called the place the Lord will provide. I love this. You know, last week we took a look at, at, at what... Uh, at, at what um, Hagar said to, I mean, called the, the place, and she said, called God your El Rohi, which is the God who sees. You're the God who sees me. And here, here he says this today. He goes, you Jehovah Jireh, which means the Lord who provides. And I want you to put those two things together right now for wherever you are in, this, in, in going through in life. Right now, I want you to grab hold of that, because man, I'm grabbing hold of this. God sees whatever you're going through. God sees who you are, God sees, and not only that, but God is Jehovah Jireh. Not only is he God, Jehovah Rohi, he is Jehovah Jireh, the God who provides. Where do you need God's provision? Grab hold of those things to, uh, today. And then it says this, and on that day, it says, on the mountain of the Lord, it will be provided. Notice this. It didn't say in the valley when everything's going good. He's going to be provided. We, where they found out that God was the provision was on the mountain, Right? It was on the mountain where he provided. When they took that step of faith, when they went all in with God, that's when he provided. In the same way, God will provide in us. Maybe some of you have never understood, you've never experienced Jehovah Jireh because you've never gone on the mountain with him. You've never gone all in with him and you've never seen what he can do or what he wants to do in your, in your life. Another thing is this. One thing we need to understand is for Abraham to go all in, he had to lay Isaac down. He had to be willing to sacrifice Isaac. Let me ask you this. What's your Isaac? Because we all have an Isaac. We all have an Isaac. We have the thing, where is your security? What's your security in? Where's your identity? What is, what is your identity in? What's your hope in? What's your, what's your comfort in? What do you find your comfort in? Because if any of those things are anything but God, you're on your way to great disappointment. And God is saying, we need to lay our Isaac down in order to have him resurrected in the way God wants. And I'm not saying that God's gonna take, you know, the thing that means the most to you out of your life. I'm not saying that. I'm saying this. I wrote these in my notes. I said, I said, the problem occurs when the gift becomes more important than the gift giver. Do you see where that becomes the problem? It says this, it's also a problem when the very thing that God gave you to serve his purpose undermines the purpose for your, for your, your life. And God gave, uh, gave Lucifer an incredible things. I mean, we're talking Satan. Do you know there was a time he was, he was the most beautiful of all the angels? There was a time he was in this incredible musician, but what happened, he started looking at himself instead of looking to God, and he started giving glory to himself and, his, and what he could do instead of giving to the glory to God, the one who, who created him and the one who gave him all those, all those things. And you know, tell me if this isn't true. Sometimes the more we've been blessed, the easier it is for that to become an idol in our life. Isn't that true? And think of sometimes that happens with money, doesn't it? That's maybe the biggest thing for, for a lot of us is that it's the hardest thing is the more you've been given, sometimes the harder it is to trust in, the, the, in, in God Almighty instead of the Almighty dollar. And isn't it weird that the thing we struggle with trusting in the, the most or the, that is the thing that has the words in God we trust on it. And sometimes maybe it's a dream that sometimes can be our idol, right? Our, our Isaac. Sometimes it can be a dream because I've seen people that, that maybe it's their, it's a dream home and, and things, but, but the problem is in building it and going there and everything, the, that home becomes more important than God's house. Or maybe it's something with, with sports. 
that sometimes that, that that becomes more important and you get involved in that so much that God gets less and less as God as that becomes more and more or maybe it's your career or maybe it's your maybe it's your your uh, education or something that again it's a good thing it's a good thing that you're going for you're trying to do this you're trying to make that you're going up the ladder whatever it is but all of a sudden this becomes everything as God becomes less and less and less maybe it's a relationship I know there's one person that we was reminded of that we prayed for this this lady she was in her 40s a pretty lady and and she was and she would come with a friend and several times we prayed for God to give her a, a husband and all of a sudden God brought somebody in her life and I hadn't seen her for several weeks and I asked a friend I said where is she, she said apparently this person's taking the place of God in her in her life and I've never seen her since that since that time but here's something I want us to understand too Mount Moriah that he put, that he was willing to sacrifice Isaac on. You know what that was? First, it was in the middle of the, the desert, right? When they did this. You know where it became? It was in the middle of Jerusalem. And it was the very part. You want to know where Mount Moriah is? That is where uh, Solomon built the temple for God. And most scholars believe it was the exact place where, where Abraham was willing to sacrifice Isaac that, that the Holy of Holies was. And I want to put up two things, that some scriptures... Go ahead and throw those up there. See where this is. One's in the Old Testament, one's in the New. One's God asking Abraham to do something. Then he said, take now your son, your only son, whom you love, Isaac, and go to the land of Moriah and offer him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains of which I will tell you. And let's look at John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son so that everyone who believes in him would not perish but have everlasting life. God will never ask you to do something he's not willing to do himself. God will never call you to do something he hasn't taken that first step in doing it. Anything that you and I go through, God's understood what that feels like because he's gone through it as well. But here's the difference. There wasn't a ram caught in the thicket. Jesus did die as the lamb of God. And God was willing to do that and sacrifice his son. And maybe this becomes more real for you and for me so that we could have eternal life. If we could bow our head and close our eyes. What's your Isaac? Is there anything in your life that maybe you're putting your faith in instead of God, that you're putting your identity in, that you're putting your hope in, that you're putting your future in besides God? Because if there is, maybe right now in your heart, lay that at the altar every dream I've ever had there's come a time where I've had to sacrifice that so that God could raise it up and resurrect it to give him glory instead of me glory and most dreams need a resurrection after a resurrection after a resurrection as we keep laying it down to God let me ask you this where do you need God to be the God who sees in your life right now? Where do you need for God to be Jehovah Jireh and provide? Ask Him. Say it. Go for the ask. Tell Him. Let me say this too. Do you trust God with your past? And do you trust God with your future? And maybe you're here right now and you've never given your life to Jesus Christ. Or if something were to happen to you today, you do not know where you'd spend forever. And it is way, way, way too important to leave this place without knowing that or stop watching without watching, knowing that. So I'd like you to pray this prayer. And everybody else, if you can help them along with this at this moment, just pray this prayer sincerely from your heart. Dear Jesus, I ask you to forgive me of all my sins. I give my life to you. I receive you as my Lord and my Savior. I want to spend forever with you. I ask for a new beginning. I ask for a fresh start. Thank you for hearing my prayer. In Jesus' name. God, I pray for every person here, and I thank you, Lord God, that you are the God who sees, that you are the God who, when you call us to a test, it's always because you have something amazing. And all God's people said, amen.